Well, thank you very much, uh, Vittorio, uh, and thank you very much, everyone, for uh, receiving us on this wonderful occasion. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, next 30 minutes, I'd like to share with you what we are actually doing at Sony CSO and our position uh, in Sony and what we are uh, trying to do. So we are actually a very small uh, research institute, actually. Uh, uh, we have uh, about a little over 30 researchers in Tokyo and Paris. And uh, we have, uh, depends on the project, we have a number of research uh, engineers actually from the Sony corporations to actually, uh, you know, for the scale up, there were the engineering aspect of the activities. But like, uh, if you, you know, this is what pretty much like what we have uh, now. And then, uh, you know, the guiding principle is actually we have like a three tenets. That one is actually on borders. Like, you know, this problem we are facing, I actually have to cross the disciplines and across national boundaries. So like uh, we have to actually you know forget about all the boundaries. That's artifact of the uh, human society, and then also like uh, we have to act because uh, you know we want to actually make sure our research result actually be implemented and deployed and change the world. So like uh, you have to you know we are you know we are encouraging researchers to really go to the field and do uh, things by themselves, and also sometimes like it's actually going to spin off companies as well. And also like uh, we think extreme, and uh, the, the reason is like uh, you know all the things that we're facing. We have like extreme consequence and extreme, you know, extreme shape. So we have to also think and uh, uh, fast track deployments is like from very basic research to the deployment. So sometimes like uh, you know uh, more uh, non profit. Sometimes going to the Sony Corporation. Sometimes like a spin off company. But the, you know we, we do everything basically. And a little bit of history of uh, Sony CSLs. Like we start thirty years ago as a predominantly in the computer science research institute, which we still do the like, computer science. But at that time. Uh, I think like hot area was like a distributed operating system, network, and interface, and augmented reality. Actually, and actually, as far as the augmented reality concerns, we are the one of the very first institution research group actually did the AR, and uh, the sound of research actually turned into like a operating system on Ivo or Playstations and some other uh, you know, Sony products as well. And then uh, uh, after that, we actually expanded the activity to add like a more scientific area, like a systems biology, quantum physics and brain science, and also like a, a range of human computer interactions. And then uh, but, but right now, we're actually converting into the three uh, major topics. One is the global agenda. Uh, and the energy, global healthcare, and agriculture. That's something we are really focusing on, serious spending, a serious amount of time. And also like a cybernetic intelligence, this is more the data analytics and the, uh, AI, and uh, probably include the industry 4.0. And uh, third angle uh, is human augmentation. So we are very serious about this, like how we can actually augment human capability, perceptions, physical, and creativity. And that's actually a uh, you know, big focus area that we're working on. So again, we start with uh, uh, some uh, introduction of projects in the global agenda area. So like, obviously, uh, we're talking about like, uh, how we can actually improve the state of the world. So, like uh, in the United Nations, is now talking about like, assist, uh, you know, sustainable development goals. And uh, uh, a lot of in, in, you know, in, in investors talking about ESG investments. And we have a, a series of projects. Uh, on this uh, service. One is cynical culture, to, you know, in urban sustainability, and in urban agriculture, those are agriculture areas, in the energy area, and some other areas as well. You know, I don't think I have time to go through everything, and so I just want to go through like a couple, uh, I think it's one, is the energy systems. So unlike the uh, you know, centralized uh, grid system, we actually opt for the uh, completely distributed bottom-up autonomous energy system. And if you look at the, uh, you know, the renewable energy, Take like a solar photovoltaic or like a wind and then a biomass. It's distributed. So like you know, per square meter energy density is not high as opposed to like a gas and oil and a nuclear. But like you know, that that's actually the nature of the most of the renewable energy is per square meter energy density is not high. And then you know, sometimes like you want to actually have like a you know, mega solar, but actually the impact, the environmental impact of mega solar is not very good actually because you have to cut off all the trees and then it's damaged all the surrounding environment as well. So like they have like a, a quite serious uh, you know contradiction. On the uh, if you have like a large scale renewable energy systems, so, like instead if you have like all a rooftop or you know small to medium energy actually in the conversion to the grid system, you know can be very interesting. And then uh, also like if you look at all the industry trend, for example like uh, 
uh, you know, we used to have a still like a TV station, movie company creates the contents, but now we have like a, you know, YouTube and Facebook. It's more the uh, consumer generated contents. And the same, the same thing in the hotel and taxi, you have like Airbnb and Uber these days actually, which is more the peer to peer. So like it's more the distributed bottom up manner. So like we assume like energy could be it another one. Of course, like how soon we're gonna go that kind of energy infrastructure depends on the infrastructure, it depends on the co uh, you know, company, you know, uh, country level regulatory <laughs> systems. Like, uh, in Japan, uh, we have like a very good conventional grid system, so it takes a while. But at the same time, like Hawaii, uh, you know, there's a state law says like everything gonna be renewable in 15 years. Like you know, and then uh, uh, developing countries like Africa and then Southeast Asia, the renewable energy is coming very quickly because the grid system is not so. Uh, you know, reliable. At the same time, there's a pressure on this uh, Paris Accord and all that. So, like, uh, there's a more and more uh, fast uptake on the, uh, renewable energy in these areas. And then, uh, what we are actually trying to achieve is like uh, from the uh, scaling up from tr standalone system to community level grid and then uh, energy code, what we say. So, uh, you know, so we have the technology to, uh, you know, ha have like, a, you know, autonomous. Uh, distributed grid energy exchanging uh, system, and then the start from the uh, standalone, but uh, we're actually scaling up uh, to the community level at this moment. So, like, uh, I show you a movie uh, where we actually the activity uh, on this front. <laughs> So, okay, so we just, okay, sorry. But this is our uh, activity a few years back in the Ghana. So, uh, Sony has a FIFA World Cup sponsor at the time, so we can do the public viewing. What we notice is that whenever the team from Africa is playing at the World Cup, there's not much spectator because they are not afford to come. So like what we decided to do is actually bring up so, you know, renewable energy public building system in African countries so they can actually watch the game. At the same time, we collaborate with the uh, uh, you know, WHO so that in, uh, in between a game, okay, like uh, in halftime, we do that with the vaccination with them. So like uh, we have like a very efficient vaccinations every time we do the public viewing. For like, uh, every public viewing, we got like a uh, a uh, couple hundred to thousand people. Like a uh, WHO was very pleased that we can do uh, you know, all the uh, uh, education about the disease or like a uh, vaccinations. So this is the, uh, uh, one of the activities actually uh, the 2010 uh, you know World Cup. And this is outside of the uh, Tamale, which is northern part of Ghana, where it's not electricity available. And uh, we show this. So we had about uh, 3,000 people uh, here. And then after this activity, we got the Japanese aid agency actually uh, supporting us for the electrification of the northern part of Ghana. Uh, we did it for Ghana, and then we did the Cote d'Ivoire. So for the expeditions that we actually not only do like a show the soccer game, we actually do the uh, uh, pretty much a feasibility study on the possible viability on the business and what are the technology requirements to actually make for those areas. When the, this is the our operation in Bangladesh, and uh, Bangladesh people don't care about the soccer games, okay? So like uh, we actually did like a stational. Uh, Silicon-based solar uh, photovoltaic panels there, and created like a very simple uh, power stations uh, in outside the village. And then we team up with the uh, uh, local NGO called InfoLady, which is a group of people who actually go to the each house and then actually uh, uh, tell the uh, villagers that uh, you know you're gonna wash hands and then uh, you're gonna do the old sanitations and then uh, uh, teach kids uh, some math or something. Like that. So but this is like, a, you know, instead of having a grid, we're going to have uh, this uh, uh, mobile, very portable battery system. And then uh, it's our staff, uh, this, uh, he's a chief expedition officer, uh, he's actually telling the, uh, how to use this uh, LED basically. Okay.
So this is an area like a Bangladesh or India, is uh, some of the Africa. They're using still using oil lamps, and oil lamp has a problem because it's dark and then they have like all the uh, you know respiratory problems. Like uh, instead of uh, having oil lamp, we got an LED, much brighter and much cleaner. So like uh, we actually distribute it to a very large scale. Uh, so they, they actually go after the, all the houses in the village and. Uh, you know, our power station is near the, uh, you know, the school, so like kids can actually bring the, uh, you know, those uh, battery system uh, when they actually come to the school and then they recharge it, and then they're gonna bring it back home when they go back home. And then, uh, this, uh, what well, is one of the info they that they are actually supporting, uh, you know, how to use that. And, uh, Just having lights, like how pleased they are. <laughs> so we actually uh, going through this. Uh, uh, this is the Bangladesh operations, and uh, you know we. So so that that's actually you know all the uh, developing countries, and uh, at the same time, like after this, like uh, we got uh, uh, evacuated from the Ghana Shire uh, uh, on the Cote d'Ivoire because uh, every outbreak on uh, uh, Western Africa. And then after the, uh, you know, the Evra is gone, so, and then we actually go back to Sierra Leone, which is the epicenter of Evra outbreak. And together with the uh, uh, Institute of Medical Science, uh, the University of Tokyo and the University of Wisconsin, because they want to actually get the uh, sample of the Evra survivors, and then they have to go to like all the epicenter. So, you know, they, would, they have to do all the centrifuge for six hours and uh, continuously eight hours or so. And then uh, they didn't have like electricity. So, like, you know, a team from the Europe and the US couldn't really get into the epicenter. So, we actually brought back the, our system and then helped in the other system. And then also, like, you know, the energy system go back to the, uh, you know, this uh, uh, Japan. So this is the Okinawa University that we have uh, a list. And then we have like a 20 house actually installed it. And they're all connected by the grid. And it's the uh, distributed grid systems. Okay, so I'm not going to uh, go for all the details actually, and probably takes uh, taking up a little time. But uh, this is autonomously exchanging the energy systems. Okay, so that that's uh, one part of the activity, and then actually we are actually expanding into energy, into water and mobility, collaboration with the other companies like Misawa and the Pius, and that we actually try to have like all the sort of photovoltaic, and then we can actually. Uh, uh, deeper the humidity by the chemical means, and then we actually uh, integrate uh, this, uh, you know, cooling system with all the uh, sort of photovoltaic and then the water supply systems. And then, uh, you know, that, that, the result, we have a quite sophisticated integrated system. What is going on now is actually without any infrastructure, we got a 26 degrees Celsius and uh, all year around with that humidity level 50 to 60 percent, which is very comfortable. And uh, with that, uh, you know, infrastructure, we can achieve this. And it's, uh, uh, it's been there for two years. And so we can actually bring this in uh, developing countries as well. So like, we have like, a, you know, sort of like a, we got energy and the water and uh, but, you know, but then we actually moving into the uh, agriculture. This is the guy that Funahashi actually was very interesting. He's, the, his argument is that, so we have like a, this large scale monoculture and we are small farmers. And the reality is like a small farming, household farming produced like 70% of the food supply on the world. And it's actually used up like 80% of arable land. And there's a little bit of science here because it's again like, capital intensive. There's not much science going on here. But uh, this is the area that we should put more science in. And so, what we actually found out is like we just uh, compared a very small scale, like in a conventional farming and cynical culture, which is a mixture of multiple crops together. And it's, you know, we have like exactly the same agricultural output, and the cynical culture is much more robust against like, uh, all the uh, you know, climate change because of the it's portfolio of the uh, crops. Okay. So, and then also it's interesting, we found out that like, uh, the cynical culture has like, you know, huge biodiversity, so it's a long tail. And in a large scale monoculture, it's the uh, you know, biodiversity is minimal. So what, what's going on here uh, is uh, quite interesting, and this is uh, part, part of the uh, you know, area 
uh, it's the image from our place. Like we have like all the insects as well, but like we actually coordinate in a way that the you know in one crop you have insect, and then uh, we actually implant the in, you know uh, crops that have the insect, which is the predator uh, of the insects nearby. So like, it's a predator predator relationship that we are playing with. Now, we actually uh, manage to have like a, a technology to control the micro ecosystem. So like we have like a gigantic database of the prey predator relationship and the crops and then all that. So like we actually try to control the uh, micro ecosystem. And what is the problem with that is conventional ag agriculture, you only need to make like a, you know, major five decisions per year and that's sufficient. But like with these crops, like, you know, we have like a, you know, uh, 10, 20 or probably sometimes hundreds of crops together, crops and vegetables together. Now you have to make a 300 decision per year and that's tough. Okay, so we, you know, the reason why we can do this, we have like a, a quite substantial data, machine learning and an IoT system to be able to sense what's going on and then from there we can actually infer what is the best decision to make and then they give it to the, uh, you know, mobile phones actually. We do operation in Africa, for example, you know, Sub-Saharan area in Burkina Faso, we, we got a, uh, have you know, initial pilot study 500 square meter and we put 150 different uh, uh, crops and that's kind of, you know, result enormous. Uh, I think we found out like a, a 20 hour per week per person uh, for the 500 square meter. They got like a hundred thousand euro per month. Okay, so with household of three, and then with this like, you know, thousand square meter plus, which, which is nothing in the Burkina Faso because it's, it's completely flat land. And then uh, they got actually the capital uh, 20 times of Burkina Faso. And you know, that our income level is average of ASEAN countries. So the Burkina Faso is one of the poorest countries in the world. So what we're actually uh, trying to achieve uh, it is actually a uh, completely change this agricultural uh, you know, technology, so to speak, with the power of like a large scale database machine learning and the sensory system. And then uh, increase the biodiversity. So that might actually help to uh, solve the problem in sub saharan Africa uh, desertification as well. And uh, now also we have a, b b a project which is called the salt, but we actually have the uh, Blue Day uh, laser pickup uh, guys actually. They actually are uh, working with the uh, Japanese uh, space agency uh, to actually have the low orbit satellite communication uh, by lasers and that will be very fast communications and then we're going to do the trial uh, on the uh, International Space Station by the end of the year. And so that's another uh, approach working. So like uh, we want to actually try and hopefully uh, combine the grid system, the uh, energy system, and then uh, uh, all the uh, low orbit, uh, fast, uh, you know, optical communication system as well. Now, let me uh, move into the second topic, and uh, uh, that's a human augmentation. What we are trying to achieve, uh, which is what the uh, Junde Kimoto, a uh, member of our team, is talking about the uh, internet of probabilities. So like we're gonna have like a, you know. Uh, you know, AI system, robotic system, or like a, you know, uh, augmented reality system that they combine with together, and it's like an you know, augmented human capabilities in, in uh, perceptions, the physical, and also the creativity. And this is a short movie talking about like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, one of the uh, our technology called the jacking. This is augmented reality technology. And you actually have like a, this is like a you know, head mount uh, system so with the multiple cameras. And what, you know, this is actually the, oh, the athlete that's wearing this. This is an unstabilized image, it's a little bit like, and this is a stabilized image, but you can actually uh, feel as if you are the actual uh, athlete. The next one would be what? Okay. So that basically this is the wearable design, wearable, you know, design hardware design technology and the real time uh, image stabilization and sensing and other technology. And this is combined with the uh, glass. That means that you actually uh, can actually jack into someone's uh, uh, vision, uh, you know, visual field, and then you actually can intervene and you can actually give instructions to someone who has the, all the AR glass as well. And then, uh, you know, of course, this will be very uh, interesting for the, uh, the security and the surveillance uh, or like a professional uh, maintenance work. You know, this is uh, uh, rather obvious uh, today, but uh, we've been doing this for, I, I don't know, like uh, 15 years by now and then, uh, uh, you know, quite sophisticated uh, technologies and then I deployed in some of the places uh, and, you know, kind of a feasibility study base. Okay, so that's something uh, we've been working on. And also like they're like switching this idea uh, into uh, bit more futuristic one actually. So Junde Kimoto usually get a 
uh, inspiration for the uh, sci-fi movies. And we have, uh, this is a Sony CSL second floor. We got like a multiple uh, camera, just like a two uh, jacking head system. And then I the, uh, have like all the, uh, you know, cloud point and then the, we can actually navigate through anywhere. And then so I move into like a, a, a 3D space and jack into the someone's like a, a you know, a, you know, positions. Then you get the uh, live real time, uh, you know, full image uh, as well. Okay. So like uh, these are the kind of things that we can actually augment the perceptions beyond someone's, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, physical locations. They can actually popping around. Okay. Now Ken Endo, which is another guy actually, uh, we're trying to augment human capability. But it's, he, he's working on this uh, uh, prosthetic device. Oops, what, what, what's going on? Uh, oops, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm just... Uh, uh, okay, so, so he's actually working on a prosthetic device. And he was actually, uh, uh, he used to work on the biped humanoid research, and then moved to the MIT Media Lab, and then uh, uh, where he created this uh, robotics uh, legs. So this is something like a high end that he created, like he's still doing this, and then he actually has like a next generation bite of uh, endo uh, version of the robotics uh, plastic device. And also uh, he's working with the uh, Jaipu uh, clinic and try to provide like a, a very low cost uh, uh, you know, prosthetic device for uh, people in, in India, and there have to be like a one uh, prosthetic device has to be less than $10. And uh, in a conventional one is not very useful, but like he actually want a 3D printer, so bring a 3D printer there, and they got a little bit of uh, uh, technical tricks. So uh, things would be much easier for them. I have the, uh, much, much better than the uh, conventional one in India uh, in affordable price. So like he's uh, getting us uh, not really entire robotics technology, that's too expensive, but like I have a little bit of uh, uh, insight from the robotics arm into the very affordable, uh, you know, like uh, prosthetic device. Okay. Now, uh, what he's doing uh, right now, the focusing is this, uh, he's actually trying to create like a prosthetic device uh, for the Paralympics. Like we have like a Paralympics in Tokyo 2020, and uh, this is one of the real, but uh, uh, he actually created a uh, prosthetic device, this one, uh, for the Japanese team, and they got the gold, uh, bronze medal. And what he's trying to achieve is to uh, get, uh, you know, uh, create a uh, you know, prosthetic device. And also it's interesting, you, know, you have to change the training patterns in your training because the dynamics to change. So like uh, we did a lot of, uh, uh, you know, physiological and physics simulations, and then what is the best training method for the people in the process device to actually run fast. Because it's very different dynamics. So like that training method for the uh, normal persons, not gonna work because it's very different dynamics. And uh, what he's achieving is to win Paralympics. I know he has two legs, okay, but like I so said, he have to have a group of athletes working with him. They to, for them to actually win the gold medal and that record to be better than the Olympic record. Then what happens, Paralympian will, have, will be able to run faster that would change the perception of the people or the what's mean the handicapped. There are things I like about this, his research is like, you know, he, he's actually a former mentor, uh, Hugh High, an MIT professor says, there's no handicapped people, but there are handicapped technologies. So like we're actually trying to change that perception. And we actually, Sony is very supporting at this. And this is actually the uh, short movie we created, uh, the Sony's uh, brand management guy created. Uh, but we actually uh, not just have the technology, but we all have like public outreach. So we actually uh, had the uh, uh, event in Tokyo, in the closing in the central Tokyo, and hundred meter line, all the Paralympians, uh, you know, a few months ago. And this is one of the guy actually who joined the event, and then we actually uh, filmed his training.
So we actually uh, did this, uh, you know, uh, you know, short run the Harime Line event in uh, in central Tokyo in uh, you know November. It's very well received, and then the uh, next target will be uh, for him to be able to uh, you know support and uh, win uh, you know Paralympic. Okay. So okay. now while we actually are moving to the last sections of uh, my talk, and then I will turn to the uh, tests after this. Like we're we talking about creativity. So this is a primary uh, research done at Paris, and uh, now spreading to Tokyo as well. Now, uh, now listen to this music. This is actually like uh, you know the you know music created by like uh, using AI system. You know the research in Paris actually created, and we put this like in you know, a YouTube uh, a couple years ago, and very well received. And uh, because this was a demonstration, we actually uh, you know create a song which sounds like a Beatles, like uh, people recognize like uh, how we do things. But like uh, you know behind this is actually this uh, you know system called the Flow Machine, and which actually reads like uh, you know. Uh, 14,000 beats, seat of the pop music, and then you get the machine learning for that. As a machine learning, what is the movement of sound that sounds like a pop music to us? And also, like a Benoit Calais, who is a composer who used the system, actually, you know, with this a specific song, and it puts like 55 different, uh, uh, you know, uh, additional Beatles song. So, like uh, with the machine learning, we got to, uh, you know, machine learn what is the movement sounds that sounds like a Beatles to us. Okay. So, like, uh, they didn't create this music. And uh, that sounds like a Beatles, but it's not a copy and paste of any of the 55 Beatles songs. Okay, so they basically the machine learned the style of Beatles and generating it. You know, of course, this is a more interactive tool rather than the machine depressing a human composer. So, like, a human composer actually uses it. So, like, uh, what's going on here is if you have, like, all the such space of the possible pop music, you know, so there's a you know, kind of pattern that, that we feel like a Beatles, like a Beatles composed actually the part of that and we actually expanding the horizon, discovering the Beatles-ish song which Beatles haven't composed themselves. So we actually uh, use this system and then uh, uh, you know, composed a quite number of uh, uh, pop music and we did the uh, you know the first ever concert which uh, all composed by the, using AI system and they have like a very briefly on the uh, another song you know typically this kind of statistical machine learning you know we generate a very similar music but like in this system will be able to create something very different like a Stop here, but like you know, this is a uh, very different from previous one, and actually depends on how the composer uses the system. So this is not really AI replacing composer. Like you know, we try to help the composer to be more creative. Like uh, based on the AI, they have a lot of phrase and then all the reasons, and then the composer can actually choose. You know, of course, like I have the capability to compose reasonably decent music completely by itself, but like uh, we actually hope to. And, you, know, you want to use AI to enhance the creativity of the humans, okay? And then, of course, like we, you know, just go through it very quickly on the third argument, which is like you know, cybernetic intelligence. We did all the uh, AI data analytics, and then actually, uh, I just mentioned one uh, project, which is actually applying, you know, physics, uh, statistical physics ideas into the factory uh, improvement. This is our uh, Kumamoto factory, which producing the uh, image. Okay, so we're actually helping them to improve this uh, semiconductor yield. And that actually improvement is so significant, they can completely improve the investment they're making for our lab. And uh, you, know, you might wonder uh, what we're actually creating this, we can actually see this uh, uh, video. Okay. So this is actually an uh, image taken by the imager that we are working with. Okay. Okay, so this is ISO 16000. 100. 
So it's a midnight, middle midnight. Mm. Okay, now we got the uh, Frisa 3200. Mm. Okay, 6400. So we are increasing the sensitivity now. a proper color and this is a middle midnight and just this uh, uh, fire and you got this okay and you see there's almost zero quantum noise you can basically detect okay so like imagine like a, what kind of precision that you have to have in the factory and it's very tough and we're actually helping the statistical physics uh, ideas to actually control the factory and that's very significant for Sony's business actually this is the, the one of the most significant factory uh, in the Sony Okay, so then we're actually going through like a this and all the production lines and then we're also working with the uh, you know, GPI, which is the largest pension fund in the world. And that's something, so we're actually going through the global agenda and the cyber intelligence human movement. Those are the angles. I didn't get into the scientific detail because it's taking a lot of time. Now, all the projects, we have a proper science and engineering behind. But it's not only uh, do the research, we actually bring it to the real world and they change things, so we deploy it. And so if you're interested in you know, doing the uh, science, good science, and deploy it. And you have to have a good science to be successfully deployed. If you have sloppy science, if you got a real one, you got a stuck and you got a problem. So you have to have a very good science and engineering to be able to deploy in a real world and still successful. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop here because I think I'm running pretty much out of time, but I got, that's something uh, we are working on. And if you hope that like, if you uh, get an idea where we're you know, going for, and uh, uh, we're going to hand over to uh, Tetsu about uh, a bit more detail on the, uh, some of the aspects. Okay. Thank you.